Very good. Okay. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very good, uh, Michael, and uh, congratulations with the book. That is, I, I wonder if is it published now? Yes, it's published now. Okay, fine. Okay, we've just gone on to uh, three o'clock uh, British time, British summer time. So I think we should begin. Hello, and thank you for joining us for readings of Nicholas Luhmann's systems theory. My name is Lisa McCormick, and I am a co-convener of the BSA theory study group. This event is part of a series that our study group has been organizing, where we examine well-known sociological thinkers, and consider the relevance of their theories to contemporary issues and debates. By questioning established narratives about theorists and revisiting their work, we aim to gain new insight into the history of social thought, as well as the social processes of our time. Today, we will explore the systems theory of Nicholas Luhmann through discussion with the authors of two recent books on this topic. Professor Gorm Harsta, who has published the Habermas Luhmann debate with Columbia University Press, and Dr. Christian Mordner, who has published The Making of Meaning from the Individual to Social Order with Oxford University Press. Professor Gorm Harsta is a Danish sociologist, political scientist, and philosopher who teaches in the Department of Political Science and Government at Aarhus University. <laughs> An international scholar in the truest sense of the word, he has coordinated interdisciplinary research networks such as the Nordic Summer University, directed conferences in Dubrovnik, Croatia, and advised the French-led research group at the, at the UN, which led to the Paris Agreement. His expertise in historical sociology and grand theorizing is well displayed in his 2016 book, Critique of the Reason of War a perspective on self-referential systems from the 11th to 21st centuries. And that is published by Aarhus University Press. Dr. Christian Morgner is senior lecturer in cultural and creative industries in the management school at the University of Sheffield. Previously, he held appointments at the University of Leicester, Hitotsubashi University in Japan, and the University of Cambridge. His research has contributed to complexity studies, social network analysis, and creative practices. And he is also interested in global cultural processes and innovation. Christian is also a co-convener of the BSA Theory Study Group. Leading our discussion today is Professor Barry Gibson, who is professor in medical sociology in the School of Clinical Dentistry at the University of Sheffield. In addition to co-convening the BSA Theory Study Group, he has also been active in the BSA Medical Sociology Group, the Coalition for Grounded Theory, and the Critical Public Health Network. Barry is going to lead the authors in discussion for the next 40 to 45 minutes. Then I will return uh, to open the floor for your questions, and we'll have plenty of time for open discussion then. In the meantime, I will keep an eye on the chat where I will also place a discount code um, that you can use to buy the making of meaning from Oxford University Press. So if I could remind everyone that we are recording this session, and if you could please mute yourself when you're not speaking, that would really help with the clarity um, of, the, of the recording and so that we can all hear each other. But please welcome everyone and over to you now, Barry. Uh, hi, hi, uh, Gorm and Christian. Uh, I, uh, I have to say, I never thought we would actually have a discussion like this at the BSA. And so I'm really, really excited that we're here today. Um, and uh, as someone who has struggled over the years, I, I think when we were talking about this, um, I did say to you that the best way of describing it uh, accessing Lumen is like getting little bits of a puzzle 
uh, and not really getting the bit in the middle. So you get a piece up here and then another piece over here and you're trying to piece together uh, the complexity of Lumen's systems theory or Lumen's theory and Lumen's approach to sociology. And it has been quite painful and quite a long period of time. So, you know, I think I encountered social systems way back in uh, 1998. And then gradually more and more material kind of became accessible over time. And I have to say that I was so excited uh, to see both these books. Uh, and I have been going through them in, in some considerable detail. So I'm really pleased that we're having a discussion about the books today on this forum. Uh, and I think that you both are bringing some really important bits of Lumen's, uh, the background to Lumen's theory, his relationship with Habermas. And actually, Christian, your book on the making of meaning is just fundamental, really important for sociologists who who are working, uh, you know, uh, with the theory. Um, uh, I have I have both books. So uh, this is the making of meaning uh, by Christian, and uh, I think this is the book by Gorm, which is the Habermas Lumen debate. They're both fantastic. Um, but really what we're here to do today is to get into the discussion. And I, I'm only going to really act as a, a discussant. So I'm going to ask questions and and try to get the conversation going as best I can. Uh, and, and so we're going to start really, um, uh, Gorm, uh, uh, if you could begin. And, and what we'll do is uh, you can speak, Gorm, then Christian, and then both of you can talk to each other. Uh, we have... Uh, just over 35 minutes. Lisa's going to stop us strictly at uh, 22 uh, fours so that we have time for everyone else to, to have a chat as well. Um, so let's just start with, with a very basic question. Um, can, can you tell us a bit about the background to the debate, Gorm, between Habermas and Lumen? Yeah, we shall go back to the late uh, 60s. Uh, to the German Sociological Association conference in 68, when uh, Lumen presented an article or a speech called uh, Society, so what society is about. And uh, Harvard used that for a seminar in, uh, in 69 uh, or 70 uh, with his students, um, when uh, Lumen actually was in Frankfurt, not in Bielefeld, but in Frankfurt for half a year. Uh, because he, he replaced uh, Theodore Adorno, the old Frankfurt School father, who was uh, the teacher of uh, Habermas uh, before. And um, uh, Adorno died in 69. And then uh, Luhmann came to Frankfurt to see if he would be a professor there. Uh, but he preferred to stay in, uh, in Bielefeld uh, because that was a very new university with a lot of, of uh, means and so on. Frank Frankfurt, school, the Frankfurt was, was a certain place with its name, Frankfurt School and so on. And, and for Luhmann, that was uh, different. But then Luhmann, he made it, um, a seminar on love and uh, Habermas on uh, bureaucracy, Max Weber on bureaucracy. And uh, somehow Habermas, he uh, tried to say, well, we shall make a book or in, in fact, his students say, we shall make a book uh, with some of uh, those uh, writings of Lumen. The one actually is translated into English uh, uh, meaning as a, as a concept for sociology. And then another article on society. And then Habermas, he, he commented it uh, with, uh, with almost 200 pages of uh, comments. And uh, then he said, well, we should publish it. But then uh, Lumen said, okay, Fine, but I, I would like to comment Harmars's comments. So he added 100 pages more, and then we had a 400 pages book, and it was published in 71. And it looks like this. I'm very happy that it's my old exemplar, and it has almost the same color as my book. So I'm quite happy about that, <laughs> at least aesthetically seen. So, uh, so that was the beginning of the book, but then a lot of discussions popped up in, in, the, in the 70s. Uh, additional books on Schorkamp in the German books, and it, uh, it very soon became a very popular, very widespread debate in Germany, but almost not in other countries. So that was the beginning of it, uh, but then it continued. With quite a lot of articles and books uh, popping up from, from Luhmann and Habermas, uh, and from uh, their students and other scholars too. So, so it became a still uh, larger debate uh, in, 
involving more and more aspects. And as well, very well uh, represented in, uh, in Christian uh, Morgner's uh, uh, book, uh, uh, there was also uh, the beginning of the conceptual history in Germany with Reinhard Koselleck and a lot of people in Bielefeld. Luan, he had his very, very big department. I think it was the biggest department on sociology in the world, 1600 students. So it was on one, one place in that very big building in Bielefeld. And Reinhard Koselleck, who's probably the, the leading uh, European historian, or more or less European, uh, leading European historian, he was in his section of, histori of history studies. And they had a very huge library underneath. And then they met. And uh, now, uh, recently, when I was there in uh, making a speech in 2009, uh, uh, they had a new institute called Historical Sociology. So they were reconciliated. So, yeah, so that was more or less the beginning of it. And then, of course, another question is how, what was the end and the consequences? Yeah, um, we, we, we will come to the consequences, hopefully. Um, Christian, is there anything you'd like to add to that in terms of the background, what you think informs the debate? I think Sofino Gorm has very nicely described, let's say, the, the inner structure of the debate, so, you know, how it came about, the, the speech at the, at the annual conference of the German Sociological Association, the, the seminar Luhmann gave in Frankfurt and so forth. But I think we could ask also the other question, you know, why did these two people so, you know, wanted actually to talk to each other in the first place, right? So what was, in a sense, the general context that motivated both people to meet up and um, have this kind of engagement? And I think in order to answer that question, it's potentially interesting to understand the situation of um, sociology in a particular period or in a particular time. So on the one hand, I mean, as we're talking post-World War II, and at that time, sociology, in particular in the 1960s, was a discipline um, that so, you know, was um, uh, very popular, right? There was a huge expansion in terms of so, uh, sociology, sociology departments, not only in Germany, but also in you know, other countries around the world. We see, so, if you know, the, there's a great differentiation um, of sociology into sub-disciplines. So for instance, it's a period you know, where we see you know, media sociology, educational sociology, sociology of the family, political sociology, and so forth. Uh, emerging yeah so a great so, you know, diversity in a sense is emerging and I think so, you know, in, it's in that particular period right so if you know where that um, enormous sort of you know a variety of different idea emerges where Luhmann you know starts then to develop this interest saying well so how can we give this um, a differentiation um, a general framework right so if you know how can we hold it all together so uh, and, and and in that sense so if you know this is where he started to develop this niche sort of you know trying to provide a more general framework so i think this is on the one hand you know his interest and i think likewise if you know when you look at the situation of habermas it's actually not so different right that we see that um in in post-war um philosophy and in so in the context where habermas is working on there is a certain dissatisfaction with a strong focus on the individual subject right you know that great philosophical tradition you know coming from Schelling, marx and all these sort of you know other people that were you know, mainly concerned with the individuals. So, if you know, like the experience sort of you know that is, is occurring at the time is something where Habermas is you know uneasy about that situation, right? And he also sees the need for a different kind of theory of society that is much more sociological, is much more social. So if, you know, it's reckoning with terms like intersubjectivity and all that, which were you know until that time pretty much unknown categories to philosophy. So you can see in a sense that interest to provide a broader general framework, a kind of you know, modernized social framework for both of their disciplines was something that was really driving these, these both authors. And I think this is if you know why they felt it so beneficial to meet with each other, because in that sense, they had quite um, similar motivations. Okay, so, so uh, yes, Gorm? Yeah, I, uh, I, I think uh, it was very important for both of them too, that it was this kind of what is uh, Great Britain is known as, as a linguistic turn or uh, philosophy of language turn, uh, uh, Oxford turn or daily language uh, turn uh, in, 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 uh, in philosophy. And uh, then the question was, how, what does that, what impact does it have in, in sociology? 
that so that was one thing, and that's another that's an, another position and what was well coming up well known for students at least in Frankfurt. Uh, that means Marxist stu uh, studies, because Marxist studies were extremely popular in, in particular in Frankfurt in uh, 69, uh, 70, 71. But and we also have this very particular German problem of how to make sense, how to make communication, how to make different oppositions working together again in a society which emerged uh, in, the, uh, in the 40s. Uh, from from a context with, uh, with national socialism and uh, a complete breakdown of sense. So I'm not speaking about uh, making sense in society or constellations of sense, but constellations of nonsense in society. And that was a huge problem for Habermas and uh, Luhmann, and in particular their generation of people born at the end of the 20s as in France too, with, with Foucault, Bourdieu, Derrida, and so on. But particularly, of course, in Germany, it was very, very important to see how to reconstruct society. And I think that's also important now to see why this debate still is popular uh, or begins to be even more popular, because now we today have some of these kinds of breakdown. But we might turn back to that uh, issue later on. So, uh Okay, so I'm looking at the time. I'm going to keep an eye on it, as and we need to move very quickly on to um, the debate itself. How would you describe the debate? What are the key sort of aspects of, of this debate, uh, and why do we need to know about it? Yeah, um, I think uh, if, if you take the book and the, the common book, the co is the book, book. I mean, this is very particular that. Two big sociologists, or social thinkers, make a book together. Kant and Hegel they did not write a book together. Uh, Weber and uh, Durkheim, they never mentioned each other. Uh, Elias and uh, Parsons, they were in Heidelberg at the same time, but they did not write anything together. Foucault and uh, Bourdieu, almost not. But Habermas and Luhmann not only wrote that book together, but they constantly continued in the last uh, book of Habermas published uh, two years ago, uh, it's very much a comment to, 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 uh, to uh, Lumen. Uh, so it's a 1738 pages big book, but it's very much discussing Lumen's uh, ideas about uh, observation and participation. I think, so if I should take one theme as a beginning of it, as a difference also, is that Habermas was very much into participation. How what does it mean that individuals or we or as a group that we participate in society? Whereas for Lumen, it was about observation. So for instance, if some of you are sitting there, what are they talking about, those guys, uh, Christian and Gorm, what are they talking about? Or you're tired, you are hungry or whatever. Then you understand very well what Lumen's position was about. Lumen's society communicate, uh, communicate about some theme, but can we understand it? Can we participate in it? It's, it's just a communication going on. I think we have a basic to Lumen that uh, in, in 44, 45, society is in war with itself. But here I am, existentially, I'm outside this. I'm excluded from this society in war, in conflict with itself. And uh, uh, so uh, Lumen, he was an observer of society, whereas Habermas, he tried to transform society, to, to reform it. He was a bit younger, one, one and a half year younger, but he was not soldier in the Wehrmacht, whereas Luhmann, he was taken in a soldier in Wehrmacht. And I think this experience is what very, very common for all of us today, that we can uh, look uh, 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 upon ourselves as observers of society, but we also try to, to transform something or we can also say that we participate in observation of society. And this is a very basic problem, at least over the last 500 years since the Reformation, but it's, it's even more actual today in, in, in our organizations, in, in our firms or wherever we are, in our families that we observe, but we also participate. So, so this uh, doubled aspect, I think was, uh, 
was very important for Hobbes and Luhmann to find out what was that about. And I think they not always realized how much they had in common. And, but also, it's also different between those two guys. So that's one thing. So it's meaning, communication, what is individuality, and, and that Christian mentioned also intersubjectivity. That was a common theme for them, uh, taking up uh, Husserl, uh, Edmund Husserl, the German phenomenologist uh, uh, who wrote a book on Cartesian meditations in 1928, was an important chapter on, uh, on intersubjectivity. That was a chapter taken up by Luhmann and Habermas. What is intersubjectivity about? So, so, and for Habermas, that was about dialogue, about discussion, whereas for Luhmann, that was about um, co-simultaneity, co being in the same time close to each other. Now we can sit discussing and so on, we, we be, being in discussion, but we also uh, in a uh, synch 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 synchronic way, in a simultaneous way, we are in the same room and we can discuss it, of course, in, in, in meetings or in, in a class or uh, in schools, we can be there together. But what is, what is uh, this as a form of communication, perhaps not only linguistic, but also being tested together? So that was, a, that was something they discussed, but they had two different opinions upon that phenomenological aspect of what is time and what is a dialogue. So, um, and then uh, there's also this aspect uh, I know that Eivind Larsen has, uh, is interested in that aspect. Hermeneutics and, from, and phonology on the one hand, and system theory on the other hand. But if you read, uh, if you have a very, very good knowledge about uh, Hans Georg Gadamer on truth and method, by the method, his book published in 1960, then you have perhaps seen that he said, well, hermeneutics and system theory arrive at the same moment as reactions to the Reformation, you have text, print and press, and then what is the coherence between texts, between the Gospels? You can interpret the hermeneutics, but you, and, and you have, and you have a Gadamer theory about that and so on, uh, but you also have the system of like, if there's a kind of coherence, a kind of constellation of meaning in between the Gospels. So that was what was important for, for Gadamer at that moment. As, I think that at least that appears at the end of, of the debate between Harvard and Lumen, that that problem was very important for both of them. Yes, so I think there's no difference, in fact, between system theory and hermeneutics. That's a, a mythology, so to say, that appeared in sociology uh, over the 60s, 70s, 80s, and so on. Uh, but I think it's time to go back and to origins or to go further on in argumentation saying, why should there be any difference? At least whether we look at, at, uh, at, the, transfer, uh, at the translations that Christian has made on, on the text of Lumen, on the historical semantics uh, text of Lumen, then we see that there's, uh, there's no difference between hermeneutics and system theory. Okay. Um, Barry, is it okay if I would just pick up yeah, a point that please. Paul said, because it might have been a lead quite nicely to some of the other issues we want to discuss. And I think it's that element, so if you know, saying that Lumen is purely observant and Habermas is the one who wanted you know, to participate and change society. And I think to a certain extent is something, I think it's a bit of a misreading or something I probably so if you know, disagree with, because I think simply their style of criticism was very different. I mean, Luhmann has published more than 50 books and more than 300 articles. So, you know, saying, you know, he doesn't want to change society is just, you know, for making all that effort and putting all the energy into this is sort of, you know, probably somewhat, um, you know, challenging. But I think simply sort of, you know, his style sort of, you know, to criticize and to have a different approach is maybe sort of just we kind of, you know, consider this not as criticism, maybe from our eyes, because we might assume, you know, criticism is something where you have to make a normative claim, I don't know, where you have to have, you know, throw stones or have to come like a certain left wing or a certain right wing agenda. So and I think in that sense, he's different, right? So in that sense of, you know, the approach, it isn't unlike Habermas, who starts with a normative ideal at the very beginning of his conception of society. Luhmann, so, you know, rather says, I don't want to start necessarily with such a 
normative idea, I even sort of, you know, want to integrate such ideas and such sort of, you know, form of, uh, you know, fictions within sort of in my analysis, right? So, you know, they have to have to be part of that. So I even want to be more radical in that sense in order to understand why sort of, you know, societies have even developed such a need for this type of criticism, for such sort of, you know, narratives and so forth. So even sort of, you know, going beyond that and, you know, even sort of, you know, doing like an enlightenment so to say of you know the enlightenment period that developed at the time so i think therefore i would i would strongly sort of you know say lumen was someone who wanted to change conceptions and who was quite interesting in developing a different understanding and maybe so sort of, you know that's related also to some of the problems that have emerged from this debate these kind of misconceptions right the way so sort of, you know we view these two authors nowadays so sort of, you know based on that debate and i think to a certain extent Part of one of the problems is, and I think so, you know, Gorm, so, you know, did like a very good job in summarizing this, is that we often so, you know, see this debate as a highly philosophical debate, right? You know, we read Luhmann more as a kind of philosophical, so, you know, theorist than as a sociologist, simply because he talked to someone like Habermas, right? So, and I think that was something that a lot of sociologists at the, at the time and later on also believed that I was saying, well, I don't need to read Luhmann because he's talking to people like Habermas, to the, you know, complex philosophers, so that's not my area. I'm doing sociology. So I think, so, you know, this is so, you know, definitely one of the misconceptions that has emerged so, you know, from that particular debate. And I think the other element is maybe also related to what Gorm said in terms of the kind of you know, title that you find of the book, the theory of society, or it's also called social technology, yeah. right? That's so, you know, um, uh, in a sense, like categorization between here is someone who is, um, yeah, so Luhmann on the one hand, the social technology who is, you know, reinforcing the, the status quo of society versus, you know, Habermas on the other hand, the kind of, you know, left-wing sort of, you know, change person, right? I think this is sort of, you know, how like Habermas presented the book. And as you can see, so, you know, unfortunately is an image that seems to have prevailed quite a long time. But I think Habermas, Luhmann potentially would say that these categories, left-wing, right-wing, and, you know, these dualisms, they don't really reflect the complexity and dynamics of modern societies because they can change so quickly that suddenly so if, you know the conservatives become the progressives because they need to defend the traditions and keep them awake and you know the left wing sort of you know become the conservatives because they, they have to defend in a sense materiality and certainly you know, access to this so you know i think you know these are showing some of the dynamics in a sense how modern society moves where you know potentially some of the readings and receptions of these two people that have later emerged you know have led to quite a number of you know unfortunate misconceptions and, and yeah, yeah have the gorm come in please yeah yeah i think it's uh, important too to, to mention that there's something they have in common in their defense of enlightenment which was very very important in, uh, in the beginning and and, and also in nowadays in the defense of uh, for instance lumens uh, uh, inauguration speech, but also how much an inauguration speech was about this enlightenment. That there's a separation of powers in the enlightenment. And that's also what is distinct, distinct from how much Newman on the one hand and the French also Bourdieu and, and Foucault on the other, uh, who says, well, we have, do not have enough separation of powers in France, but uh, Newman and Habermas had to, to explore what was differentiation of power and how can it be reconstruction? How, what, what are, what is the differentiation compared with differentiation? So I think that's just one of the, so to say, one might say critical points uh, in, in Luhmann's analysis. I think more and more, in particular based on empirical studies that Luhmann, he's even more, at least cognitively critical than Habermas, definitely strong, more critical cognitively from an empirical point of view than Habermas. And what also is important when we read uh, uh, Luhmann and, uh, but perhaps also Foucault, it is that empirical studies, if they are, if we, are, we go deeply into empirical studies, they are very philosophical. They, there are a lot of uh, philosophical issues popping up, emerging as part of, of the empirical studies. So we are not um, trapped in between indu inductive studies and uh, deductive studies but we are into some uh, kind of abductive study. So, so there's not a zero sum game between theory and uh, empirical studies, but there's a plus sum. I think that's very important if we 
uh, work with Lumen to, to recognize uh, that aspect. And then there's something about blind spots and risks and, uh, and a theories of how, how risk, uh, how society is at risk and so on. And that's very much into uh, critical uh, themes. But also uh, on a philosophical level, uh, they have something in common with, with uh, Immanuel Kant, who was the first, and I mean, it's the, that he is the big author to speak about what critic is about. Uh, and uh, Luhmann, uh, I think he's even more uh, close to Kant than Habermas. But that's a long discussion, which we should not take up here. Um, I'm, just, I'm just thinking for the audience, if, if we took just one basic concept, uh, where there are differences. Um, so you started with the idea of intersubjectivity and the problem of intersubjectivity. Can you very quickly, because we're literally 10 minutes and then we're going to stop and we're going to have a broader dis discussion, very quickly uh, tell us about their kind of differences or different approach to intersubjectivity. Yeah, I can do it. And it's in, in my book, I, I argue that Luhmann, he has a, a take on uh, temporality, which Habermas does not have. Uh, only one place Habermas approaches a little bit in an article in, in 76 uh, on, on history and evolution. Uh, but uh, Luhmann, it's, it's all over. It's all the time that, that discussions dialogues, uh, communication takes place in time, and that means at the present moment. And uh, then we can reconstruct what, what is time? Well, we, we, we talk in time, in a situation, we talk about what time is about, long term, short term, and so on. But what is, what is the, the, the short term or, or long term in a situation, as in a communic communicative situation? For how long time shall we discuss Habermas and Luhmann, for instance? <laughs> well, now it's two hours, yeah. but they have discussed it for more than 50 years, and they're even continuing after Luhmann was dead. So, 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 so what, what is time about? And Habermas did never really get that point. Uh, it was really difficult. Sometimes in a, in a recent book, he approached it a little bit, and I wonder what he says to, to my book now, because he, he's still alive. He's the only one alive from that generation. Uh, still writing and reading and so on, but but uh, but uh, uh, intersubjectivity that was about the present time for Lumen, whereas for Habermas it's more about the uh, question answer question answer question answer interpretation of one on or other. So so but you can also um, communicate simply by being. Uh, there at the same time, even not only in, in this little group, but also in world society. And I think it was one of the learning processes uh, of the pandemic crisis, and we also heard from, from, from the Cold War that we are living synchronically in the same world society, which can ex explode completely if we have a, a, a nuclear war. But we also have a, a pandemics uh, spread all over, and we have to react in the same way, more or less. Or we learn from each other. So there's a kind of evolution, a learning process about how to do as the others do. So, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so um, how would you say, like, so for example, Habermas has this kind of, there's almost like a shared understanding, am I right? Uh, you know, they, 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 you can reach this kind of shared uh, intersubjective kind of agreement around things, whereas Lumen actually isn't that worried about that as such. He doesn't go down that. He doesn't, you know, Lumen's analysis of communication is much more complex in the sense that it starts from a, a completely different premise, really. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that is very different. But is it, I mean, there's also something uh, very common for them. One way to interpret it, that's a kind of Lumanian response to Hartmann's last book. I mean, Luhmann, he's, still, he's up in his heaven. And he can then read uh, Hartmann's 1700 pages book and, and say, what, what, what would he say? I think one way to read it is to say, well, Hartmann's talk about the, uh, talks about the Eucharist. The Eucharist in the church. So, so the, what is that about? You can sing together, you can have a, a, a gospel together, and you can do it in a 
Putin way, with, 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 in an orthodox way, in a Catholic way, a Protestant way, but there's something about using communication, the words in communication, and being dependent of these words, but you are also doing it at the same time simultaneously. But then you are at risk because some of those ris risks are um, trapped in synchronicity. You are trapped in the world, in the words, in the, uh, so to say, the steering systems. And that's uh, for sure, that's a huge difference between Harbaugh and Newman, that uh, Harbaugh in the beginning thought that the systems are about steering systems, that, that we can plan, planify what will be the output from the basis of input to systems. That was completely wrong. That was not yeah. what Luhmann uh, tried to take up and, and the, the turn Luhmann made in system theory. And it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's even possible to predict that everything will go wrong if we use the idea of systems uh, as steering systems uh, based on input towards output. That was exactly what the American army did in Vietnam and Putin does now uh, in, in, in Ukraine. And the problem is that see, systems cannot be steered. They are not possible to control. So there's a kind of differentiation where each system, there can be the legal system, there could be arts, the art system or research system or love system. They, so to say, they control themselves and that's their function. Their function is to be close to their own codes, their own semantics. Okay, and Christian, would you add anything to this particular part? I think, you know, we use, the, we use the word systems quite a lot. I mean, I've noticed, I recognize that this word is um, used again and again. And um, I mean, you know, part of the book the making of meaning, as you can hear from the title, is not called the making of systems. And I think that was quite a deliberate choice because part of the problem, again, so if, you know, potentially deriving from that debate is, is so if, you know, with this, with the kind of, you know, labelism as we, you know, find it typically in the history of sociology to put Luhmann into this corner as saying, it's all about systems and mm -hmm. these kind of, you know, reproducing systems and codes of systems and, you know, systems here and systems there. But I think what is already quite interesting when you look at the debate from 1971 is that in that book, he published a chapter which is called Meaning as a Basic Sociological Concept. Mm. So he didn't publish a subchapter into that is called System mm. as a Basic uh, Sociological yeah. Concept. Mm. But that was not really you know, taken on. Um, so meaning is a much more profound and basic term for you know, the buildup of any kind of social relations, even systems. Right, and I think this is you know, something that I wanted to try to advance you know, with this particular publication, you know, showcasing there can be very different readings and he's much more sensible to the, to the messiness and to the fluidity and dynamics of, of meaning making as sort of, you know, a term like systems sort of, you know, would necessarily suggest. Yeah. And I think this is something that's coming also you know, through very nicely in the translations of the other chapters that we give in there by Luhmann is actually applying this uh, idea of meaning in a, in a very empirical project mm -hmm. where you know, he's looking at the transformation of certain types of meanings, you know, the, trans the transformation, let's say, or the invention of the concept of the individual and individuality. He's looking at that and how this is emerging in modern society, how this is related to the structures of society. He's looking at sort of, you know, a great deal of different um, empirical works and archival materials so very much in a tradition of you know Michel Foucault or Norbert Elias in terms of his methodology so there's sort of also like a very rich in a sense um, empirical tradition that you can see here and I think all of that is in a sense is a bit hidden from us if we just sort of you know, approach this important sociological project from this sort of you know more philosophical understanding of you know uh, systems and and the kind of you know negativity that mm. typically sort of you know comes with that term systems. Yeah, I, I think that uh, in in my book I have two chapters on, on history and evolution. It's almost hundred pages, and uh, con they are concerned in particular Luhmann's ideas about evolution, the evolution of semantics, and there I think this idea of of meaning uh, as a broad conception since Max Weber, uh, particularly more Weber than, than Alfred Schutz, uh, than uh, Alfred Schutz, uh, the German phonologist, uh, that we have this um, 
emergence of semantics, semantics transformation, semantics about time, semantics about art or religion uh, and so on. And I think that's a big break off. The, the, the big revolution in Duman's thought was his book on the function of, revolu of religion, uh, which was uh, finished uh, in December 76. Uh, and that was the first, uh, so to say, major Lumen, book of, of the major Lumen. Uh, in fact, he published, he, he not published, he, he wrote a huge book, 1100 pages big, just before, but it was not enough for him. So he was, didn't, it was not uh, published at that time. It was published in 2017. But this, uh, in this book of, on the function of religion, we see how semantics uh, devel uh, develop, uh, codes develop, and then uh, orthodox codes and codes about codes and so on. And a lot of, it's a book about conceptual history also mentioned at the same time, they, 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 uh, published at the same time as, uh, as um, Reinhard Koselik published his, uh, his uh, first uh, major books on, on, on conceptual history. I think that's um, uh, that's fair, fairly well to, good for you, Christian, to say so. At the same time, at a certain moment, in the emergence of concept codes and legal developments, organization developments, then we have ideas of systems popping up. But then we have a inside his theory, we have a theory about how the concept of systems or the concept of organization, the concept of law or art and so on, how these concepts emerge. Yeah, cool. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not denying sort of, you know, that the term system is, is used in this theory, but I think there is a bit of a problem in a sense of you know, reading this particular sociological approach as if it is just about systems and nothing yeah. else, right? And I think exactly. Luhmann, Luhmann himself, and also you know, he was always a bit, he had a strange feeling because often sort of, you know, he went to conferences and part of you know, going to these conferences and doing these speeches, almost you know, making a bit of a joke was like in the entire presentation, avoiding to use the word system even once. And he was still presented as a system theorist and still sort of, you know, discussed as a system theorist, although sort of, you know, the term didn't appear at all in this. And also you know, the writings that we translated in the book of the meaning of making also are very scarcely sort of, you know, using that particular term. So I think there's also a bit of a question on our end as sociologists, if you know, not to shy away when we heard the term system and really see so if you know there is a lot more to this particular approach yeah. than so if you know what we might so if you know understand uh, what is meant by this particular term. Yeah, I, I think what I think, I think we have to actually stop now. Am I right, Lisa? Uh, we're at forty minutes in, um, and I think we need to field questions. Sorry, guys. You can see literally we covered a small portion of what we thought we could uh, in the time that we had. Uh, the discount codes in the chat for for uh, the making of meaning, uh, and it's a good discount actually. It's thirty percent off that price. Um, I think we could move now to, to for comments. Uh, Lisa, do you want to take the questions? Uh, how do you want to do this? Uh, happy to. So uh, if you would like to raise a question or make a comment. Um, ah, excellent. We already have somebody demonstrating how to do this. Um, along the bottom of your screen, there's this little reactions icon, which you might have gotten to know extremely well during the pandemic. Um, if you've had a break from Zoom for a while, that's where you find it. Reactions, click on that. The raise hand is there. That is one way to indicate you would like to intervene. Um, another way to indicate that you would like to, to raise a new thread or join the thread that's going on is by indicating in the chat. Um, where uh, we will keep an eye on these things and uh, and invite you to join the discussion. So um, over to you. Um, uh, 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 I don't know how to say your name properly, <laughs> you have, Mr. Larson. Some problems with my name. <laughs> I, I'm a excluded from world society because of the U, which is only known in uh, Denmark and Norway. But uh, my name is Eivind. Um now, uh, I have a question to Christian Morgner, uh, and it's a, a follow up question to what he uh, you presented uh, for a few minutes ago. It's a, the question about the significance of meaning in, in Luhmann's uh, theory. 
I, I, I find it interesting to understand, uh, I would like to understand more closely what, uh, what, uh, what is, uh, what is uh, the meaning I, <laughs> of this uh, perspective you have on, on uh, uh, Luhmann's theory. Um, could, could you uh, 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 try to explicit uh, more uh, um, the difference between, on the one hand, uh, uh, what you speak about in the meaning and, and, and the other perspective on what you spoke about system? Could you try to explain uh, uh, more closely? Okay, yes. Uh, thanks for that question. I'll try my best to do that within um, so a few sentences. I think what is quite interesting about Lumen's approach to meaning is, is the idea in a sense that he feels we can't just explain meaning through our everyday understanding of meaning. Like in the everyday understanding of meaning is very much in a sense a linguistic or language driven understanding of meaning. Like what does it mean? You know, what is, what is the meaning of that? So that's, I think, a very sort of, you know, common definition how we could uh, uh, describe this particular term. But Luhmann would say, Actually, my conception of meaning is much more basic because even already asking that question presupposes meaning, right? So I think there is something about the way we experience the world is already, you know, always driven in a sense by meaning. And therefore, you know, his definition is very much not by this, you know, fixated understanding that in a sense, something has a certain identity, you know, the identity of the, of the meaning of the word book or the identity of the meaning of computer, but you know, what something, the meaning of something is always a meaning it has in contrast to something else. And so, for instance, you know, the meaning of the word book, right, is something in terms of, uh, like, the other objects you find, you know, computer or, you know, device and so forth. So it always sort of, you know, has this other world in a sense to it that is not in the moment being actualized. So all these other, you know, potentialities, all these other possibilities are always integrated. They're always there. Right, so and therefore, in, in that sense, meaning is always something that selects something out of a horizon of many other possibilities. Um, so you know, you can always go back, right, and you can always change something. So there's a lot of, so in a sense, fluidity and flexibility in the way we experience the world. And then, so you know, that question for him as well. So if we start with this great uh, fluidity, so you know, at the very beginning, at our conception of the world, and not you know, at consensus or you know, of normative integration. How can we actually see that you know some sort of you know social order or structure emerges? And I think this sense of you know what terms like system or structure are coming in because he's saying, well, you know, to a certain extent, certain areas of meaning need to be selected. They almost need to be carved off, so to say. They need to be differentiated from others, right? So for instance, as you know, we talk about the meaning of love. Right, and the meaning of love, you know, we can sort of you know, understand and feel and experience this particular world and area because it is somehow differentiated from other areas, right? But so, if, you know, within that, right, within that, you know, particular meaning, right, within that particular horizon of meaning that we then experience of love, we can go even deeper, you know, and explore that in very different ways. And therefore, it opens up very different dynamics. So, we see, so, if, you know, how meaning, you know, forms of selection, complexity, system formation and so forth are so if, you know, quite nicely and quite elegantly built in relation to each other but they're not so if, you know, necessarily driven in a sense by saying you know this is the most important category but there's quite a different variety of concepts that are actually needed in order to understand his approach could, could, could i just take, uh, give one comment yes is that okay uh yeah no so so uh, to understand you could we say that uh, meaning in, by, by Luhmann is not in singular, but in plural and uh, in, as meanings, which are uh, expressed in uh, different uh, systems in the sense, for example, love is in one system, uh, um, uh, another system could uh, be economy, me, and so on. Is that what you try to say? It's not only the plurality of meanings that is out there, right? It's not just, I think, with meaning, and I think this is a bit the, I suppose, if you know, thing that's maybe a little bit difficult for understanders, why I said it's not the kind of language understanding of, of meaning. It's not just what's there, right? It's not just, you know, the meaning of book, or it's always also all that which isn't there at the moment, because we can really only understand 
the meaning of book because of all the other meanings from which it is differentiated from, right? And only sort of, you know, because of, you know, society has developed to build that capacity, some form of a meaningful experience is actually possible. Yeah. yeah right? exactly. mm -hmm. And I used to, to use the example of, uh, for instance, what is the absolutely opposite of a glass? This is a glass. What is the actual, the, the, the complete opposite of a glass or the complete opposite of a book? or a body or whatever you can mention. And then we think in terms of horizons and the communication is always uh, taking these, these kinds of horizons of what is all also uh, always um, uh, implied in uh, our understanding of, uh, or in the communications understanding of what meaning would imply in that situation. So we cannot close uh, this meaning in this in this way we, we know that we do perhaps in, in some systems but there are always horizons of additional different uh, viewpoints and uh, and terms and and uh, long term short term and context of a certain text the context is always much more than simply the text of course lumen as a lawyer he knows that very well that you have a text but then you have an, a context to the text, but the, the text can then communicate with its, uh, with its uh, other, but the context is uh, implied as something which is outside what is inside. This is, fem this is phenomenology and hermeneutics in a very basic sense. So. Um, Okay, um, would you like to add to this a name I can pronounce? Christian, another Christian. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Well, first of all, I want to say thanks for this um, uh, very interesting um, seminar. I think uh, I've, been, I've been in the UK for a number of years and it's kind of hard to find Lumen related work in sociology in the UK. You find it more in law. Um, so I think, I mean, I. I I, I kindly ask you to keep doing uh, Lumen related work in, in any form, in seminars, in book discussions. Uh, so my, my question is related to the reception, precisely to the reception of Lumen's work. Uh, because if you think about, for example, Bourdieu or uh, Foucault, or even uh, someone more recent like, like Latour, you, you, you see Kind of a very even uh, distribution of influence across many many different countries but if you look at Luman in a map it's a there's a very stark sort of a absences um spaces where it it, it didn't really make a generated kind of a, a sustained um influence uh, and, and i'm thinking for example about france or or the uk uh, as uh, examples of countries where for some reason, the, 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 the Luhmann's ideas uh, didn't penetrate it as, as they did in places like Brazil or Japan or Chile, which is where I'm from. Um, and, and I wanted to ask both of you if you think that the, the discussion between Luhmann and Habermas has to do with this a little bit, uh, or, or, or you could trace this, uh, this sort of uneven reception in, in that discussion or are there any other factors? So I, th I think, I mean, it's, some, it's like a question actually, um, Christian, that Gorm and myself discussed um, you know, in advance to this particular seminar. And I think I had the impression, Gorm, that you know, we were quite in agreement that um, this discussion or you know, the framing that uh, Luhmann had with Habermas at that time really you know, also contributed to his reception. And also in particular to some of the, you know, we might call the misreadings or, you know, misinterpretations that emerged um, later on. And I think I've mentioned that one of them is that because, you know, Luhmann discussed with Habermas that in particular also, you know, just, you know, in the countries that you mentioned, but also in, in, in German sociology, it was often seen as a kind of philosophy or social philosophy, right? So he wasn't often regarded as a sociologist, although he himself very much saw himself as a sociologist, had published in sociological journals and so forth. So in that sense, although so, you know, it definitely so, you know, helped with his popularity, it maybe didn't help with his popularity so much within sociology, right? He was you know, much more read also in the German speaking countries and other disciplines, you know, literary studies, 
culture studies, management, and so forth, then really sort of, you know, in, in, um, in hardcore sociology. So I think, so, you know, we can definitely see, so, you know, that this played a role. But then the other element, what you'd also see is in terms of the framing of the book, we discussed it a, bit, a little bit, social technology and theory of society. So the title and also the, in a sense, narrative that Habermas presents here puts Luhmann sort of, you know, into this a conservative corner Right, you know, someone who's just observing society, who is kind of, you know, not questioning really the status quo. And at that time, and then, you know, obviously also later on in sociology, sociology always considered itself as a very, uh, itself as a very progressive discipline, you know, wanted to change stuff, you know, society. And that stuff, you know, didn't seem to fit uh, with the image that was given to Luhmann at that time. And then, I know, as I've just mentioned, the focus on the term systems um and that tradition so you know and not really seeing there is much more to Luhmann I mean there are other terms you know we didn't discuss complexity and so forth I mean even so if you know here in the UK uh, there is a great deal about uh, complexity studies and the term is used very often and you never see so if you know Luhmann is featured or mentioned in there so I think that initial framing or you know you might you could say you know use a term from media communication priming in a sense was very much influential for you know some of the other readings and conception that then um, followed later on. Go on, would you say, so if you know, this is a apt description. Yeah, yeah it was, uh, I would like to say also that it, it's a kind of rumor that Luhmann is difficult to use or difficult to read. I think Habermas is far more difficult to read, uh, in particular to translate. Uh, uh, Christian translated some of the most difficult parts of Luhmann's writings. But uh, Habermas is really hard stuff to, to translate. It's like Adorn or Hegel, uh, such a guy, or Max Weber to translate. But, but uh, Lumen is much easier. And I used to, to, to I'm coming from a Scandinavian background, that, so I have to translate him into Danish. It functions extremely easy and fast. So, so uh, and, and we also in Scandinavia, and particularly the so called Copenhagen School around uh, Niels Andersen. Uh, uh, makes a lot of we, we make a lot of empirical studies with Lumen systems theory, and we can see also that students actually understand it quite fairly, really well. Uh, how much was far more difficult for Kuhl, also very difficult. Uh, if you use for Kuhl, you have to, to at a certain moment to begin to study for Kuhl and not the subject you're into. So, so but whereas Lumen, a few articles and a few interpretations, and then it, it just runs. Then it functions very easily, and it's it's. I think there's something with this manipulation from. I think the the worst uh, author I have seen there is probably Thomas McCarthy, who uh, re uh, from from uh, Boston, who reinforced the misinterpretation uh, of Harmars, uh, and, and uh, how Harmars misinterpreted also Lumen in the beginning. But uh, then he reinforced the idea, whereas Habermas was saying it all the time, you have to read more Lumen. <laughs> uh, and he said so to Axel Hornen and to some of his other st students. Uh, whereas um, uh, McCarthy, he simply refused to take it into the American account. So, uh, and, and since the United States uh, dominate research in such a huge uh, way, as, as Michael King very well has. Uh, as uh, described in in uh, in the additional uh, last chapter of uh, your book, Christian, uh, th then we have a problem with the United States here, uh, whereas uh, we can see other interpretations too. I mean, the Chinese have translated Lumen's uh, book on 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 uh, law as a social system in forty thousand exemplars, and so <laughs> perhaps China is. is um, uh, is taking the lead uh, above the United States in a few years of time. I don't know. <laughs> so it's just a little, a little note here, but it, uh, uh, Lumen is not so difficult to, to, to use. Uh, uh, but of course, if you want to understand all what he's writing about, the same with Habermas and with Foucault and so on, you have, then you have to read thousands and thousands of books. But, but this is not the, the issue for, for, for students, neither if they read Foucault or Bourdieu. So uh, it's much easier to understand Bourdieu if you've read Foucault than the other way around. If you have read, uh, if you have read Lumen, uh, then the other way around. So, and even if you read Lumen, then you can understand Hegel, which is a big advantage. Hegel becomes easier to read if you have read Lumen. That's also a way to. 
to to see uh, Lumens Rising. And I think that uh, that was inspiring for many of us that uh, we began reading Lumens through the eyes of Harvard. And then we begin to begin to misinterpret. And then we try to see, well, there's still more to it. There's still something more there's to be added. And then at a certain moment, well, this was wrong. And we try to apply it. And then we begin to see that, well, there's perhaps 30 years ago that there was much more to be said from, from the point of view of Lumen. There are still questions for Steena and Nico and Michael. So I stop. Yes, I was hoping we could get to translation again later, but uh, we've got a few queued up here for questions and we actually have some uh, more questions in the chat. So let's start with Stina and then uh, we'll go from there. Please take okay. it away. Thank you. And thank you for these presentations, which are extremely interesting. Um, I have the book uh, by Gom and I will certainly uh, make sure that I will order the one by you, Christian. Looking forward to reading that one. Um, I don't know if my, uh, it's, it's perhaps more reflections based on what you've been mentioning so far. And um, the first one relates to this thing about Lumen uh, making changes in society, a descriptive or normative approach where I, th I think there is a, a strong normativity in Lumen's work because, you know, being born or raised in some extent in a totali totalitarian regime, I think systems theory can also be read as a solution to how not to enter into totalitarian regimes, how we can sort of delimit systems, um, you could say power, perhaps that's not the right word to use, but I think you get my trail of thought. Um, so I think that there is a strong normativity in that sense. Um, the other thing was about this uh, duality of observation and participation. Because if you look, for example, as uh, in if, if you go to research on um, interactions, or maybe I should contextualize that a bit. I'm a, I'm a sociologist of law. And in my research, I uh, analyze, for example, interactions, legal encounters between uh, marginalized citizens and welfare institutions. So I, for example, um, analyze interactions between uh, the citizens and caseworkers. And so you have this uh, interaction setting, and in that interaction setting, it's very much uh, regulated uh, by law. There is a strong welfare law uh, characterized by framework law. So there are like uh, goals and preambles, but not so much details of what will happen in these encounters. So what happens when, when I as a researcher look into these encounters is that citizens, they construct a uh, meaning they observe the interactions from one perspective or, or one um, observation position and caseworkers from another. So they are in the same interactional setting, but constructing different meanings of that specific setting. That also means that their participation becomes somewhat different because they um, semantically connect to different things just to give an example, uh, with long-term unemployed persons, the goal is to help the citizens re-enter into the labor market. The caseworker wished to investigate the potentiality of the citizens, like what can you do, what is your work ability, whereas some citizens are more reluctant, focusing on their health, such as a, 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 a how do you say, like a, um, a weak back or uh, mental issues as social anxiety. But the caseworker constantly tries to construct meaning based on these limitations, seeing the limitations as potentiality, saying, for example, yeah, OK, so you have a sore back, so maybe you can work. Uh, let's say you work four hours this week, and then we try with six hours constantly constructing meaning surrounded or related to the citizens' potentials, whereas the citizens construct meaning related to their limitations and that affect their participations in their interactions. And, and this just makes me think also about the complexity of our modern life, how our, from a radical epistemology, epistemological perspective, how we observe you could say similar social events differently, construct meaning, and how that obstruct common 
participation in society. It really challenges uh, a unity of society, you could argue. Yeah, so yeah, I don't know, but maybe if you could elaborate a bit on this potential or lack of same in participation and observation, that would be extremely interesting. Thank you. Oh, so I think that was I was quite I'm not, I wasn't quite sure, Stina. So you know what what is the question? So you know, in here, um, is it more um, is it more a comment you were making, or is there? Yeah, you, it's it's, uh, it's, it's yeah. both a comment, but also a question. Like for example, when you talk about observation and participation as two things taking place at the same time, then from a radical epistemology epistemological perspective you could say that you potentially always observe things differently so if observation is related to participation then participation is potentially also always different so what what does that do for cohesion in society for example well, i can see that i have made about the same thing uh, the same kind of study uh, analyzing war veterans because they also have psychic uh, psychological uh, systems which are completely uh, really lacking uh, sometimes any kind of, of, of sense in, in, an, in any kind of meaningful way and we see that by the way the conspiracy mythology is nowadays uh, but uh, that emerges also that's also where the system, modern system theory begins at the end of the First World War, where they have millions of, of war veterans, which are completely excluded from society. And even theologists and, and art and so on, they have to reinterpret what is meaning and what is coherence about, what is an individual about, and then the individual realities break down. So that's, uh, so that's very close to your analysis, but it's really a, an extremely radical way of seeing that breakdown of Sense making or sense of something as it's called in German or constellation of meaning. Uh, so, uh, and we can see that in art with existentialist uh, art and so on too. But another way to see it is uh, when, when I was in the in the COP uh, uh, process uh, and, and stepping the, the, the COP 21 in the Paris, the Paris Agreement in 2015, we began working with it in uh, 96, 97. Uh, and I used uh, Luhmann's theory, but also Hamas's theory, uh, in order to find out how to frame the, these kinds of conferences. And the, the point is that we have uh, an organizational system, uh, uh, or an organizational structure or framework that um, resembles and uh, that uh, uh, makes a kind of, of uh, um, association of all those different perspectives with different system perspectives, but also different um, participants from different states and so on, from different state organizations. They participate, they have to ne negotiate together. Is that possible to make a consensus conference? No, that would be a distance conference. They will not communicate together in any consensual way, which Habermas would like. But the problem is that we are living on one earth, so we have to communicate together. We have to do something about it. So what, what to do then? We have now the functional systems not cooperating together. We have, uh, we have different codes, uh, different uh, disciplines, different validity claims or whatever you might have there, the, and different time uh, temporal perspectives too. Uh, long term in, in, uh, in Oklahoma is not the same as long term in, in China uh, or, or Iraq and so on. So, so what to do then? And using this, uh, Lumen system theory, of course, <laughs> that means interaction systems. We have to make a lot of pauses with coffee drinking and uh, dinners and so on, walk and talk and go into the park and so on. And th there people meet not necessarily on what they agree or uh, disagree upon, but they meet on the coffee, on the dinner, on uh, having been on the same uh, uh, kinds of holidays uh, in Dubrovnik or or, or 
having children in school or, or whatever, skiing lessons and so on. So that's what they begin to discuss in a very concrete way. And so it was very necessary to integrate that into the process. Luckily, the organizers uh, came from, from uh, Paris, from France. So I knew very much about, really much about uh, uh, French diplomacy and what uh, dim diplomatic, diplomatic negotiations are about. Not going to the case directly, but going into the meta communication about what is going on. And also going into the silence and so on. So I think that was very important for the for the success of the the, the, the uh, Paris Agreement in in twenty one uh, in in, uh, in nineteen fifty it's two thousand fifteen, but of course also because there was this uh, uh, this uh, um, attack uh, terrorist attack in in Paris just uh, three weeks before, which made a contest that now we have to find some solution. I don't know how much you have followed what happened in November 2015, but a lot of things happened there with terrorist attacks and then the, the, the solution in the, in the COP21. So what we made that planification uh, with Jacques Delors and uh, with some French diplom diplomats and so on uh, some 18 years before. This seems to be a good moment to make a connection to a question that came up in the chat, which is about the relationship or the contrast between meaning and instrumentality. Um, did you want to weigh in on this, Christian? I didn't see, I didn't see the. I didn't see the comment. Um, the comment think... is: Can meaning be interpreted in contrast to instrumentality? No, it can't. So I can definitely say it can't because. Again, any sense of instrumentality, you know, if we say so, you know, it has a means and an end relation. Again, so, you know, presupposes that um, the rules, so, you know, that inform this have to be meaningful. All right. So, again, so, you know, any sense of instrumentality, um, so, you know, if you give it like, let's say, a more linguistic interpretation, saying that there is a certain identity in terms of, you know, what are the means or, so, you know, what are the aims. Again, so, you know, that, that requires that this is something that can be differentiated. From other possibilities, other we couldn't we couldn't identify something as an aim, or we couldn't identify something um, as means. They're not just there. They're not speaking for themselves, right? They're not just saying, "Look here, I'm a means, I'm an end," and so forth. So again, so if, you know, it's instrumentality is uh, quite a sort of you know elaborate outcome in a sense that had had to develop, um, with, you know, with the evolution of society um, and you know presupposes meaning making. Excellent. So um, let's go back to the queue. Nico, I think you're next. Very much. And thank you to Gorman and, and Christian. Um, <clears throat> Christian's book is in the mail. I'm waiting to read it. I'm sorry that I missed. I'm really sorry that I missed the discount code. Um, Gorman's book, I enjoyed very much. Um, I also, I'm I don't know if you know about this, but I also already published a review about it a few months ago. Um, I have two questions. The first is regarding the Habermas Luhmann debate and the, the, the joint publication that led from that. Now, I know that an English translation was made, but was then rejected by Habermas on the grounds that he was not happy with the quality of the translation. And then the project died off. Um, so I was wondering maybe if Gorm, especially you, if you know of any potential um, projects or in your research of this book, did you try to see if that, that original uh, joint book could be translated again? Um, and actually pub be published this time. Um, and then my second question um, is a more open one, um, aimed at both Gorm and Christian. Now that we're also standing at the, you know, I think the, the person that came off better image-wise was Habermas from, from, from that incident for a couple of decades. Now that he's also at the end of his life and also 
become much less popular than he used to be. Um, just in your personal opinions, do you think that there's a re-evaluation of both these thinkers and that perhaps we're talking about short term and long term, Gorm was. Um, in the longer term, is there maybe a, some kind of redemption story for the one coming out of this better than, than we thought decades ago? That's all, thank yes. you. I, I, I think so, yeah, that it, the, the long story will be better for in particular Lumen, but uh, it's also why in the end of the book, uh, I discuss uh, uh, not only Habermas and Lumen, but also Foucault and Bourdieu. Others could be included as well. Um, but I, I think that the, the, that's my take, and I have discussed that with Habermas, because the others are dead, but I would have discussed it with Lumen. I have, have discussed it shortly with Lumen too. Uh, it is that, that um, uh, the, a, a huge narrative now is how to compare those different uh, positions. You, if you take the, the case of Stine before uh, with, with the marginalization of, of case uh, among case workers and clients, uh, what would uh, Habermas say to it? What would Lumen say to it? What would Bourdieu say to it? What would Foucault say to it? What, what could be the most fruitful a way to break up these kinds of paradoxes between, for instance, case workers and clients? So I think this kind of comparison is very useful, as we could also compare Max Weber and uh, Emil Durkheim, for instance, on the same issue. Uh, but uh, I think that will, that will be the future. There will be a lot of PhDs on these issues here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the problem with Foucault is that, as I see, many, of, many people using, uh, analyzing Foucault, they begin to analyze Foucault himself and not, they forget about the case about their problem, so to say. They have to observe the problem. And their Lumen's uh, way of analyzing is extremely useful to stay concentrated on the problem. And then you can look at some tools or some codes and how do they understand or misunderstand what the problem is about. Um, uh, at least from a sociological point of view or political science point of view, that's very important. So, but I, perhaps it has something to do also with with this uh, possibility, possibility of a republication. Uh, I think that this is a very meta theoretical book, this old original book. Uh, first time I read it was, was uh, at the end of the 70s <laughs> when I was a young student and I was quite shocked <laughs> to, to read it. What, what, what was that then about? So, so, but it is very meta theoretical. It's not such an empirical work, so it is, much easier to read for philosophers than it is for most sociologists. Uh, so, uh, and that's of course a, a problem for such a book. But another thing, theme is to say, well, now take Harper's Newman, what would they say to empirical problems? What, what to say about, for instance, the notion of power? I think that's one of the, the, the solutions also, I uh, published several articles on that subject too, but uh, what is the power of power? How does power, what kind of meaning is, is implied when we talk, when power talks about power, when it empowers itself? And you, if you say it in German or French, that's much easier to say so, that, and also in Scandinavian language than in, in English, because in English you have to use the word empower, but in German you can say Macht, Macht, Macht. Macht. Power creates power by talking about power. And that you can say in French too, because power, pouvoir, uh, c'est pouvoir constituer le pouvoir par le pouvoir. That means you can, it can um, create itself with its own differentiations, with its own semantics. So it takes power over itself. So that's a kind of, so to say, a Bourdieu and Foucaultian reading of Lumen, but it's also a Lumenian reading of Bourdieu and Foucault. Uh, Habermas will not go so much into that. That could be about separation of powers and so on. So, so there, there's a, there are a lot of possibilities to go on, uh, creating new possibilities and a new uh, way of, of, uh, of readings and uh, solving paradoxes and uh, empirical solutions. It's, uh, I think it's, it's very important to think empirically about, about these issues. Otherwise, you'll get lost in philosophy.
and even Kant, he was very empirical too. So, so, uh, so uh, you have to. There's not a zero sum game between theory and empirical studies. Gorm, um, is it okay if I just you know come in here? So, um, Nico, you might have seen in the chat, uh, Michael King mentioned. Um, and I think, you know, there's also, you know, email and correspondence evidence uh, where Habermas refused um, to have the book translated. So I think that's one, one element. But then the other one in terms of, you know, the re-evaluation question, I mean, you could say to a certain extent we are having here this discussion is part of a, is part of a, a re-evaluation. But then I think maybe I'm mean, slightly pessimistic. I think in general, uh, both of their ships are sinking, so to say, when you look so if, you know, at the broader reception of sociology, at least so if, you know, when you look at their sociological reception of them. I mean, uh, for instance, Habermas in his book on the theory of communicative action proposed this great um, idea of the uh, colonialization of the life world through systems. N no one talks about this anymore these days. You know, that sociological project had been abandoned not only in wider sociology, but even in Frankfurt, right? And even sort of, you know, the prospects of a broader sociological theories of, you know, let's say if it comes in either sort of, you know, critical terms, no one is doing that in Frankfurt anymore. So, you know, in general, so if, you know, the project of a theory of society, I mean, there have been no, no serious publications in this, in this area for the past 30 years. So therefore you could say, if you look at this from, will there be a re-evaluation? It's probably rather pessimistic because, you know, that, you know, particular interest that was quite dominant in the 1970s and 1980s, also when you look at a no number of other authors, that Gore mentions of, you know, like sociology seems to have lost a bit of appetite in these kind of, you know, grand, uh, grand endeavors. So therefore, um, I don't really expect like a major discussion coming up where, you know, these two people or in general, this project is going to be uh, uh, rejuvenated in the near future. Yeah, but it's also because uh, in this 70s, a lot of resources and new positions popped up Whereas nowadays, uh, not so many positions popping up. So there's uh, also some empirical co context uh, to that uh, issue, if, if they're discussed or not. Uh, I, I think, I think Gorm, it goes back to what we said at the beginning, that in the, in the 60s and 70s, sociology was a very a popular discipline, yeah. right? And many students wanted to study it. There were also huge investments on the side of many governments into sociology because there was that hope that sociology you know, would be this one of these disciplines that could you know provide a better governance of society um so can you know, over help to overcome some of the problems that were experienced with world war ii so again you know it was almost a bit like a celebrity discipline during that period with a lot of investments sort of you know that went um, um into this and then obviously so if, you know all of these hopes and you know expectations that were you know, probably very unrealistic then obviously didn't materialize in the 1980s and 1990s and so you know these these you know grand projects you know became less and less possible because then suddenly sociology was put into this corner i mean to do now something and to deliver that change in a sense that was promised or you know attributed to this and you know these projects didn't seem to be you know, associated with what we consider change and the right criticism and you know what needs to be done so therefore you know they they find themselves potentially in a in a very difficult position yeah, but I'm sitting in Denmark, where, where sociology is still very popular and far more popular now than uh, in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and uh, far more Lumen studies nowadays than, than uh, in the 70s. So I'm not so pessimist. Uh, and we have, a, it functions very well in Scandinavia. Even now in uh, Sweden and Finland begins to be a member of NATO and so on. So uh, well, it's, it's different from Sweden and uh, Norway, Finland. Uh, and, uh, but, but I think there's also some, uh, some uh, very concrete context uh, uh, with, uh, with it. So, uh, and I think also there are people like uh, Hartmut Rosa. Uh, he, he's very Lumanian. He's far more Lumanian than he's... Uh, Habermasian uh, and uh, so on, on the acceleration of society and these kinds of ideas, uh, which are extremely much on Lumen's uh, temporal theory. So, uh, and so it's just one of them. Uh, Paul Tansky is very much Lumen and Habermas put together, uh, just as another figure there. So, so um, I'm yes. not so, so pessimist. Yes, um, let's go on to another question. Uh, Michael King, would you like to join us? Yeah, it's more, more of a comment than a question. 
Um, yeah, firstly about the translation, I've been following the, um, the dialogue on this. Um, my understanding is, and I haven't seen these um, letters this is, that supposedly were found in Newman's archive, but um, I, I know for certain that Habermas was, was not keen on publishing a translation of this book. Um, and when I was actually involved in negotiating with um, Columbia University Press for um, what turned out in the end to be um, Gorn's book, um, Habermas even got his published to say that they wouldn't be happy um, to um, allow extracts from the book to be translated. However, you know, it was pointed out to them that this was not actually in line with copyright law. And so they sort of, um, a lot of they said, they said, to, um, they, they accepted that, and but it was a hard struggle even to get um, extracts copied. Um, Habermas was not happy about the book and what he said in the book is my view, and that his his appreciation of Lumen I think changed over the years, and he became it became clear to him that what he originally the way he did originally interpreted Lumen was wrong, and he didn't want this to be uh, he didn't want this to be exposed to an Anglo, uh, Anglo-Saxon audience. That is my understanding of what happened. I may be wrong, but there it is. However, it's not really what I wanted to, to, to talk about. And um, I mean, I think we're missing a, a whole a whole sort of um, dynamic, a whole aspect of Lumen in the discussion so far. And that is that um, Lumen was, is extremely subversive. He undermines everything that one holds dear, truth, um, morality, justice, equality, all these uh, tend to be, to, to, to disappear and vanish when you actually try to, when you actually understand what Newman is saying about, particularly about meaning and how meaning is formulated. Um, I and mean, I think you need to really grasp that before you can grasp Newman. And, and I, I think it it's really contradicts the way in which Newman is used in a sort of instrumental way particularly in which systems theory is used in an instrumental way. I mean, Newman is, he calls himself the devil because he just takes everything away that you, you cling on to as, as, as being reality and shows you, shows you this isn't reality at all. This is just reality as society today um, shows itself to be, um, is what, what itself identifies as reality. It's not in any way in any absolute reality. And this is extremely important when you look at things like um, COVID and you look at um, global warming as I'm doing at the moment, that there, there is no reality except the reality that society projects onto itself and then acts as if it were actually true and real. And that's what, you know, what we're doing with global warming. We're acting as if the scientists know what the future is going to be um, when we're sort of responding to that in ways um, um, that seem to be to meet that future which the scientists have identified, but it isn't the future. It isn't a real future. It's it's a it's a it's a construction that uh, has been made by scientists and has been uh, then interpreted by different systems, law, um, law, economics, and particularly politics. And we are really in the in the throes of following what the politicians say the future is going to be, rather than what the real future is going to be, because nobody knows what the real future is going to be. So I'm just sort of putting that forward as a whole new dimension, which we ought to be looking at if you really want to understand the difference between Habermas and Newman, because I think Habermas is much more in a world of reality, I mean, his world of reality, where you had these oppressive systems, um, which were um, uh, restricting and constricting and, and, um, and, and in some ways threatening the life world, which was the true um, consensus of people meeting together and coming up with solutions which reflected um, their own and uh, their uh, advanced needs, which you know that, that was his reality. And it was a much more concrete and much more um, um, positive, if you like, um, way of seeing things in Lumen. But I mean, I, final word is that I mean, I think that you really need to destroy everything before you can create it in Lumen's terms, and you have to accept that there isn't any reality and then then look at and see how we actually set about, we have actually set about society, set about creating that reality. And until you can do that, I don't think you can really grasp what Lumen is about. And I think that's particularly true, particularly evident in the book 
that um, Christian has edited uh, and the readings from that book where you see Lumen sort of questioning sort of basic fundamental ideas that we have about the individual and about revolution and, and you know anything at all really he questions and says but this is only something that society has created and then and then acted as if it were real. Here we are. Gorm, please go ahead and respond and then we'll move on to Yeah, Eric. just a short response here. Um, you, you, you're right that Habermas mis uh, misunderstood it and he, uh, he's much closer to Luhmann nowadays, in particular since 86, after Luhmann published uh, Ecological Communication, uh, Ecological Communication uh, in 86, uh, then uh, he realized that Luhmann's theory was about different sorts and different themes and he sought and and then he turned into legal sociology which is your theme by the way so 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 uh, but um luan is not an idealist he the, and and his idea of reality is so to say that reality is a blind spot and in the, on that subject he's very very critical very realist and very useful also that we that uh, all kinds of scientific approaches, all kinds of communication has a kind of blind spot to it. By the way, it's an idea probably coming up from from uh, from uh, Theodore Adorno, uh, and uh, so there, there, there are something which is beyond our our um, uh, observation of what it, of what how, how we communicate, but, but in particular. Uh, what is beyond uh, the meaning we can give to it is in our own way of, uh, of interpreting of, of our uh, systems with which we, can, we uh, observe, for instance, uh, research systems as we do right now, or mass media systems and so on. Uh, these kinds of blind spots. So there might be, be by the way, be an also a, a future area of, of uh, analyzing the, the, what. Uh, but I think uh, uh, Adorno did, did quite well in some of his writings that what, what are these ansich, the, the, I don't know what ansich, uh, what it, that does mean in English, but, but uh, I think that's a way to, to deal with it too. This is a, the idea of, of also not, not umwelt, not, not environment, but world as such, world ansich, as Kent talked about it. What, what is that about? What is our blind spot? in all forms of communication, so. I think Lisa, if it's okay, just you know, adding to what Michael has been saying that I think this, this, this radical element that Michael just mentioned is potentially so, you know, one of the elements that might also explain the reception pattern that we see with Luhmann. We mentioned, you know, we heard that uh, Christians, you know, said earlier on that Luhmann is quite popular in countries like Brazil or South America, or we heard also in Denmark. And I think to a certain extent, you might say, well, you know, these, if, if I may use the word slightly more peripheral countries, you know, within the tradition of sociology are, are obviously also you know, at a greater freedom because they're not necessarily dominated by the mainstream or like the dominating narratives as we find them in the US or you know, in France and Germany or in the UK. And obviously, if you're a sociologist who is very radical, who, as we heard from Micah, really questions everything. So if you know, you know, I mean, he's a danger. To, to that mainstream. So, if, you know, he endangers, so if, you know, what we, you know, consider holy, sort of, you know, what we consider for sociology is about, how we go on about this profession and so forth, right? And therefore, obviously, it's, as Mike has said, sort of, you know, he's a bit the devil, sort of, you know, and who really, sort of, you know, wants, wants to deal with the devil. So, therefore, you know, there is definitely, sort of, you know, that ignorance and because of, you know, the, the huge challenge in a sense and huge unease, sort of, you know, and the change, actually, you know, sociology would be required to do in order to incorporate Luhmann. So in that sense, you know, he's probably you know, much more radical and we could say you know, Habermas is much more complacent in terms of their criticism uh, that we currently see. Michael, did you want to put a final word in on this before we move uh, on to Eric? Yes, okay, I, I mean, I, I, I think that's right, what, what Christian was saying. I think that, that it's very threatening, uh, Luhmann is very threatening and particularly threatening to sociology and to, to mainstream sociology, because it undermines um, a lot of the basic assumptions of empirical sociological research. And that isn't something which, you know, a, 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 um, an academic discipline 
um, which relies upon empirical research as it's as it's a fundamental belief system cannot really tolerate and I think that's why Lumen has been so marginalized particularly in in um, Anglo-Saxon countries and particularly in the USA. Okay dangerous ideas here we're discussing. Eric Erickson please. Yeah thank you but I don't know if I should say anything because Michael King took my points it is also uh, I uh, very much like his uh, intervention here so so uh, thank you for that. But uh, so, but maybe I could, could say it all this all the same. The the thing about participation and observation, as far as I understand it, it is in a, it is a kind of the, it is a question of methodological approach. It's not about uh, who would reform society or not. Uh, how was his point about the, uh, the this uh, this participatory perspective? Is basically because that is how you can understand society from the from the point of view of the participants because they are the ones that uphold the society through their interactions so in a sense they cannot be only observers that they have to be to, to participate and feed it or and see it like their world it's not a kind of foreign foreign world or something coming from from Mars so 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 that is for what I see as a methodological difference here in, in that sense that it is, it is not the kind of uh, who are in a way a really formalist or who are uh, who are going to change society but it is about who how you how you um, analyze society do you do it from this third third uh, uh, point of third singular point of view or from or from a, a, a first person point of view so so that that is that was that is the role of performative that that is so so very fundamental for, for this perspective so but so but the the book that uh, Gorm has been holding up all the time i think that in that book there is a a, a phrase from from Hobbes, which i think is very interesting i think it is from that book so that a meaning cannot be created administratively and that is very that is a very interesting uh, in interesting phrase. Meaning cannot be, uh, and 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 that is something that I cannot see that that uh, uh, Roman has any uh, thing to to say to. And and uh, and and in a way, I would I I, I think that is not, I don't like the, to see the thing that that this Hamas approach is so normatively laden from from the very start. I I, I don't see. I don't see that, but what I see here is a kind of of of, of a democratic element in in a sense in this in this in 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 this uh, conceptualizing the the, the um, society or um, and that is in a way that if everything is up for for grabs, if if it is only manipulation or interests are behind it, and then uh, and it is a kind of uh, functionally needed for a system to 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 survive then what is that what is there for democracy and what what is it for what is there for for a kind of or meaningful meaningful life so i will wonder if there is any comment to that one in a sense or or is that also something that belongs to the what they forgot what is the the very old european way of, of seeing of, of seeing things that has been that modernity has taken over. So, so, and and and, and just uh, just to come on this meaning of it, that seeing that is a kind of that is something that is only interested, mediated, and that everything has to have to pay to play a function in order to survive, and these kind of things that makes us of this this uh, theory very subversive and and and, and undermining what. Uh, what 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 we have, but also a kind of very cynical, cynical perspective of, of of society, which I do not think sits very well with a kind of participatory uh, a reconstruction of or a reconstruction of society from a, a, a participant point of of of, of view. So thank you. Um. Uh, Barry or Lisa, is it okay if I just come in and if, you know um, react to the I, just you know on the point of functionalism, Eric, that you made in there? Yeah. I think for, you know if you sort of you know look at you know from a historical point of view that 
you know, systems theory as developed by Nicholas Luhmann, at the first glance, you might say it's a functionalist theory. You know, Luhmann speaks, for instance, of functional systems. But I think only a second and closer look really shows that his theory itself does not have the characteristics of any kind of, you know, traditional functionalism, but rather reflects functional analysis as a method that is central to the place between theory and the reconstruction of the phenomenal area of sociality. So functional analysis is a, a theoretical method, um, so to say, right? So, on, you know, this theoretical method combines two strategies. So, and the first one is that what is treated, you know, as occurring, what is given, the reality is actually considered in the light of other possibilities. So it is made, so everything sort of, you know, is seen sort of, you know, through this contingency, you know, what Michael said, so if you know, this radical sort of, you know, otherness and these other possibilities. And that sort of, you know, strategy is then linked to the comparisons of, you know, really different and diverse things, right? And whatever is in the focus of interest is then related to what Luhmann's calling problem aspects through which various solutions to problems can be placed. Um, so, you know, in terms of, you know, so-called functional equivalence. So therefore, you know, this kind of, functional method is using that problem and problem solution scheme not built you know upon so you know then you know thin air but only so if you know makes sense if it speaks to problems you know if they can generate if they if can be understood as you know gen structure generating moments of systems um for instance you know whose scope for like combining um you know events then can be addressed as problem solutions so i think in that sense from this point of view functions are not needs right as we typically see them in function analysis as if a system all systems have a need and you know this is sort of you know their functions but the functional method is actually much more a directive for comparison and then in that sense when you see yourself you know that you see something in the light of other possibilities how these other possibilities can potentially sort of you know structures of you know uh, leads of you know to the formation of structures you actually see that his method really sort of you know deontologizes what we observe and really you know, is quite a radical form of deconstruction and it's nothing sort of you know, like the traditional functionalism that starts sort of you know, with these you know, pre-assumed needs or given needs. I mean, all sort of, you know, these you know, could be further than analyzing why has sort of, you know, society developed such a need for you know, such you know, given understandings or such ontologies, right? And even that sort of, you know, could become a form of empirical analysis uh, uh, for Luhmann's theory. I mean, he doesn't start at all, so if you know, with the kind of traditional, uh, in a, the early, so if you know, 20th century functionalism, as we see. So I think this is a really, so if you know, potentially important misreading that we see with Luhmann's theory to say he is a functionalist. I mean, he is definitely not. Have you, have you read his Rechte uh, aus Pension? So, shall we move to the next question? Barry, back to you. Uh, I actually just want to come back very briefly on what Michael was saying. Uh, one of the big things, because Michael, you've talked to me about this over the years, and, and we've often discussed it, and, and it relates a little bit to what Gorm's been saying and uh, some of the material in Gorm's book, which was just like a, a huge penny dropping for me when I was reading it. And that is that Lumen and uh, Habermas, to an extent, were, were addressing the debate on positivism, uh, the Imre Lakatos, the kind of criticism and the growth of knowledge, the scientific programs, they actually address that debate. I didn't know that until I read his book, uh, this, this Lumen Habermas debate book. And the really interesting thing from my point of view as a, as a jobbing sociologist working on teeth believe it or not um i kept using uh, qualitative methods i kept finding distinctions and analyses that lumen had written in all sorts of weird places very strange i'd, I'd find it within a text and it, you know it'd be kind of fleeting glimpse of kind of analysis of distinctions of kind of codes things like that that would earn their way into my work in ways that i just didn't anticipate and that's why i got interested in lumen back in the 1990s and it took years seven years to try and decipher some of the text because and i think lisa said it that translation definitely 
has been one of the problems that 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 uh, a kind of uh, jobbing person like me has trying to be overcome overcome but i i think that actually you're right if we go down the the kind of positivistic route of normative science uh, as in testing hypotheses or falsifying kind of theory then uh, lumen turns that upside down i mean he he really does you need a different model of of analyzing things but as gorm has said i he his work is empirically brilliant it works really well uh, compared to anything Habermas had to say. I always find Lumen really useful. So I, it's just a thought. I just thought I'd put it, up, put it out there. Yeah, if, if I may add something here, I also tried to test Lumen theory. In particular, in a quite profound way on, on war studies because we lack a sociology of war. And then I used Lumen to to establish a kind of uh, system theory of war, or how, do, how does war emerge as a cult before we have any systems, and at a certain moment we speak about systems of war and so on. And then I used it to also to predict, but the point of predicting and explaining is not Lumen's point, but it functioned far better than any other theory. I mean, not September 11, but September the 12th, 2001, I wrote a huge article uh, about what will happen in the aftermath. And it functioned like a warm knife through warm butter. Uh, what will happen exactly, how and where and what, and why would Iraq also be attacked and how many people will be killed and why wouldn't it function for the United States uh, and uh, why wouldn't it function in Afghanistan? I mean, it's it's amazing the number of blind spots you see, the, the temporal aspects, the conflict, the risks, and so on. Because, uh, uh, in fact, the American military, they used system theory, the instrumentalist idea, the steering idea of old-fashioned system theory. They used it, and they still use it. Uh, um, Putin probably uses it. <laughs> it, it but it does not function. And then you can see why it does not function and what will happen with the environment and how, how the American military in Afghanistan and Iraq try to communicate with itself and turn into some kind of blind spots and risks and so on. And it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's completely absurd to see how well that uh, Lumen theory functioned to, to observe those, those problems. So in that sense, Yes, it's a critical theory. It's really an oppositional theory. It's, it observes blind spots, it observes risks, it, uh, it observes how uh, a number of system communications are blind towards uh, the environment uh, and uh, how different, uh, uh, how people are excluded uh, and turned more or less mad, traumatized by this kind of exclusion. And, it's really astonishing. Well, Lumen, he could not write a theory of our war because he was too close to the object because he had been a soldier 15 years old in the Wehrmacht. But, but, but uh, so it's a, this is also kind of blind spot of, of uh, German sociology that they had problems with, but there are about 10 or 15 persons working with, with, uh, with Lumen system theory of, uh, in, in terms of war. But, uh, well, they are too close to it because they are Germans. <laughs> so, so, so uh, I and some of my other colleagues uh, in, in Scandinavia, we have tried to to do it uh, also in some other countries too. So, uh, so it's um, I don't know if that's a response to about how to how to work with this theory. So, uh, and I I must say also that the 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 huge problem was to, uh, to get the theory right. The, what, is, what are the codes of the codes and the semantics and the uh, structural copies between which different kinds of codes, which is very funny. And then you have to read thousand books and so on. And then you can see how it functions. But that's the same in all kinds of, of, of themes you, uh, on which you write your PhD or your doctorate or whatever you, you, you work with. So. It's always about reading more books, isn't it? 
I think we have exactly the right amount of time for two last questions. So I would like to invite uh, Steve Watson to ask the first one. Right, sorry, just lost my unmute button. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you to Gorm and Christian. I'm uh, most of the way through Gorm's book. Um, and uh, what I really just want to make the observation about this, uh, which is point for you to respond to. Christian, your book arrived the day before yesterday. I started that and I've been determined to finish Gorms first, but I can't wait to get into that. Um, and I think one of the things that's important as I've been kind of over the last two or three years, been increasingly going down this route is I think Gorms book, it is really helpful to see these how this theory is developing in a contextual and almost kind of interlocutionary way between Habermas and Lumen. Somehow that made the things that I was thinking about even more clear. So that's very helpful. And I kind of just start to see the same with Christian. I think especially, you know, when you start to take these from uh, particular perspectives. So that's the point I really wanted to, to make there about why I think this is, you know, the, these are use, both useful texts in the, in the present moment and helpful for people who are kind of, you know, getting into these ideas. That's Thank you, Steve, much appreciated. Thank you. Well, I'll make sure to put that discount code in the chat again so that if the book isn't already on your shelf or on its way to you, you will be able to acquire one at that special price. Roderick, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks. It's a really interesting conversation. And um, I did two books I, I am going to order now. So, you know, you've made a good sale there. But I, I mentioned in the chat that... Um, I'm actually a kind of a Habermasian scholar, I suppose. So I'm researching the, the colonization uh, thesis. And as part of this, I'm kind of revisiting the, the Habermas Lumen relationship and debate. And I would say I agree with a lot of what has been said. I think there's more of Lumen in Habermas than is generally recognized. And the, their sort of interaction went, was long standing, even beyond that, uh, that early debate. They continue to watch each other's work. and very much kind of reference each other. Um, and I wouldn't put myself, you know, strictly within the Habermas camp to, to kind of suggest that Lumen is, is bad in some sense. And I, you know, shouldn't be read that there's a lot of value there. Um, but one, one thing that, that troubles me a bit, so like there's a huge amount of radicalism in, in Lumen's theory, but there's a, a kind of a stumbling block, I think it, when, when you read his, uh, his theory of the economy, uh, particularly in, in ecological, um, is, is that the book Ecological Communication, I think. Um, it, it's, it's very, very consistent with a, a kind of a Hayekian interpretation of, of what the economy is as an information system and price signals being hyper efficient and this idea that you shouldn't interfere with it in any way because that, that affects like the communicative capacity of the system itself. And so a de-differentiation, any kind of imposition of political precepts on the economy is, is problematic to Lumen. So it, to me, that, that's a part of his thought which, which problematizes the, the radicalism. So what, what I, I just put that as a, as a question to you both if, if you have thoughts about that, because, um, it, and of course that doesn't take away that his theory could be potentially more radical than he himself kind of used it for as well as it is another thought um and and sorry just one additional point which i meant to mention at the start is there's also a very interesting relationship between habermas and lumen and their common root in parsons as well they both have dif different relationships to parsons so maybe if you have time a brief comment on, on that too i'd like to hear so uh, thanks yeah i can respond on on the economic uh, theme um well, one thing could be uh, that uh, Lumen studied in Freiburg and Breslau, uh, and that was a uh, high place for uh, back in the 40s, 50s, early 50s for some kind of uh, liberalism. But I think that was not the case. If you go into uh, Lumen's uh, theory of economy, the 
important uh, aspect is about time. So money and credit investments are all about time, um, time, time binding and how time binding can communicate. Uh, so, um, so it is uh, not so much about objects as about how uh, there are differences, point of, different point of view on, on time. And that's also the problem of, of, of course, in of, uh, of uh, accumulation of uh, capital. Uh, that accumulation can take place if one uh, part uh, observes capital and uh, observes the time in a different way than the other. And then we have a kind of asymmetry between different parts. But Elena Esposito, in his book, in her book, The Future of Future, she, she is now in Bielefeld. It's an excellent book on the aspect of time. And if you look at the history of money and the history of uh, credit, uh, credit and credibility, which is uh, very useful to it is very useful to look at that with Lumen's theory and a lot of writings on, on that subject. Then you see a, a series which is extremely strong in explaining a number of the risks in um, financial systems and how it functions through history. And you can also now I as, as just to refer to, to war before and war history is very much about financial history too, about cre uh, credit systems and how they emerge and, and the risks uh, to it. And then you can see how, how um, the finance of some huge projects as war or building bridges or building uh, airports, I don't know what, how and, uh, and uh, creating, uh, uh, investments um, can create a lot of uh, environmental problems for uh, the environment and, and, and environmental problems for other systems too, other functional systems too, including for, for, for psychological systems too. So, so uh, uh, yes, I think in that sense that Luhmann, he continues a theory about uh, about economy and finance and the creation of finance where Marx stopped it. And I think one of the differences, well, how, uh, how Marx also took, took, took temporal dimensions into account, but Luhmann is, is even more on that subject and in particular on, on the subject of communication. And then you can see, so it's possible to create a huge uh, theory of economy, which is quite different from what we see with, with Hayek. Uh, who individualizes uh, problems like the rational choice theory and so on. Uh, Luhmann does not individualize this at all. He says say simply that individuals are outside this way of communication about prices and investments and credibility and so on. It has more to do with theology, so to say, theological history about what is credit and credibility, accountability and these kinds of things. So uh, that might be one, one, uh, one response to your question. Um, go on, Sofina, if I may uh, continue from this. Um, I think, Sofina Roddick, what Luhmann tried to achieve in the book, Ecological Communication, was maybe, you could say, sort of slightly more limited. And I think, but still, Sofina, nonetheless, actually quite interesting, because the question was, how does modern society react to envir environmental problems? And I think traditionally, I think the assumption was very much that, you know, Addison, let's say, you know, the politics sort of, you know, could take this into their hands and then, you know, change certain things within the economy or sort of, you know, other parts in society. So there would be some sort of, you know, coordinated effort, right? And I think this is like an assumption, you know, some sort of, you know, critical perspective, right? Some sort of outside perspective, you know, either being a social movement that could sort of, you know, transform the entirety of society. But I think what Luhmann is trying to showcase in that book is that, the different systems of society react very differently to what you know their understanding is of ecological problems and so on the one hand you could be you could say well you know the economy is of you know reacts to um, uh, environmental problems you know mainly through prices or you know through the invention of new products and maybe sort of you know that's something that's quite limiting but on the other hand you could also say you know, there's a lot of potential in there, right? In terms of, you know, green products, green markets, you know, solar power, and, you know, all of the stuff, so, you know, that has been 
invented stuff, you know, through this very complex dynamic. And you see stuff, you know, within politics, green parties have emerged. Within education, you see environmental education has emerged as a program. Even sort of, you know, when religion stuff, you know, you see like, you know, vicars sort of, you know, talking about co-op 26 and, you know, praying for the leaders of, you know, to do the right things. But so, you know, all of these reactions, in a sense, you know, work according to what these systems are capable of, you know, in terms of their meaning making, right? So, if you know, what they can, so if you know, connect, in a sense, with their operation. And that, so if you know, leaves then society a bit with a, um, so if you know, difficult situation, because there isn't that kind of, you know, coordinated possibility, in a sense, anymore, some sort of, you know, overarching morality or some sort of, you know, privileged point of view from, you know, which or that, or this, could be coordinated so therefore sort of you know ecological problems really you know pose a severe challenge so if you know for these reasons and i think the book is actually quite nicely able to to demonstrate that why so if you know some sort of you know easy solution or why some sort of you know we all just need to come together and need to have a good agreement you know in a pub you know all that sort of you know isn't working because of the complexities and the uh, dynamics of these different systems so i think this is you know something i always find quite striking about that book which was published in, in 1986 uh, so not so you know very recently when you look at some of the ecological debates we are focusing at the moment the other element you ask about parsons habermas and luhmann so their relationship i think both of them so habermas as well as luhmann always admired parsons but they always admired parsons for that grand project right for you know having the courage to say, you know, develop a theory that sort of, you know, tries to explain, you know, large parts of society. I mean, it was, it was, you know, at the time, a really sort of radical project, so to see neither Max Weber or Durkheim or sort of, you know, one of the other founding fathers had sort of, you know, tried to theorize within sociology to such an extent. And I think that aspiration was something that both Habermas as well as Luhmann admired, right? And throughout their careers, I mean, they always ignored you know, the decline of Parsons in, in the United States. They remained in contact with him. They invited Parsons for, you know, various conferences to Germany and so forth. And I mean, actually, at one of these conferences in Munich, like in 1979, he died in a hotel while he was, you know, invited to, you know, one of these conferences that Habermas, as well as Luhmann, um, organized. So they had, sort of, you know, this deep appreciation for that grand thinking, but obviously, sort of, you know, they rejected you know, very much of the of the of the core of the theory, you know, Luhmann sort of, you know, didn't go with the normative integration and the kind of functionalism that sort of, you know, is uh, associated with Parsons and likewise sort of, you know, Habermas was obviously really interested in the normative integration, but not sort of, you know, then into this fixed sort of, you know, status quo relationship that we often associate. But I think sort of, you know, there is a, there is a really sort of, you know, strong and close relationship that both sort of, you know, had with this uh, um, theories of, you know, over a decade of many years. So I think, which is, again, so, you know, not really reflected, at least in, 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 in German sociology. Well, I'm very sorry that we're going to have to end it there on that note about collegiality and pursuing uh, more of these questions about things that we've forgotten or things that we need to investigate further to understand this important chapter in social theory. Um, I also uh, wanted to invite everyone to join me in expressing our admiration for our authors and discussants today, Gorm Harsta and Christian Wardner. Thank you also to Barry Gibson for leading the discussion today. Um, I hope that you will be joining us in the future um, for some of the events that we're in the process of organizing for the next academic year. This is the grand finale uh, for our series this particular year, but um, hopefully we'll have the chance to welcome you again in the future where we can continue the discussion. So thank you very much. Have a good day and see you again. Thank you. Nice. See you everyone. Yeah.